All right, so um, I'm going to have a little bit of time at the end for some questions. Uh, Seattle RB folks, we got some guys up here. Any other Seattle RB folks? Oh, gosh, we got a bunch. Oh, that's good. So um, at the question time, I'd actually also like to uh, invite any of the Seattle RB folks, if they have their opinions, also to share them as well. So before I begin, I would actually like to say thank you to Ben and Karen and Jonan for uh, the tremendous effort that they've done to put this together. Uh, thank you guys so much for taking the financial risk uh, to put it together. I also want to thank the Seattle Ruby Brigade, uh, who made my club viable and possible. Uh, thank you guys for the over dozen years that you guys have been, you know, doing the work that you do. Really appreciate it. So in particular, I want to talk, or I want to thank also Ryan and Eric and Aja. Uh, these three in particular, they were uh, very supportive and uh, gave me the tools and everything to succeed in my club. So, and they've always been so welcoming. So, uh, oh, also there was um, this one other guy uh, who attends there. Uh, I've tried to talk to him over the years, but um, whenever I see him, he just runs away. So um, I don't know. I think it's because he's kind of shy. But um, you know, yeah, he's, he's definitely shy. So. By, by the way, Aaron, when I was putting these slides together, I, I found you with this huge skillet. What on earth are you cooking that thing? <laughs> anyway, so my name is uh, Miles Forrest, and this presentation started as a lightning talk uh, back in uh, RailsConf in Portland. Uh, did anybody see that lightning talk? OK, a couple people. Um, so when I gave that talk, um, I, it, was a, it was a structured talk. And I got it down to six and a half minutes. And as I'm going on stage, Chad Fowler says, Miles, you got five minutes, and we're going to cut you off. So when I gave the talk, I'm going like ridiculously fast. So that was the reason why. So this talk that I'm giving is actually the talk that I wanted to give. Uh, unfortunately, um, for those of you who have seen that other talk, I'm not really funny. So um, I'm going to reuse some of the jokes that I had. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so earlier this year, um, Ryan Davis gave a talk at uh, Mountain West RubyConf, which I think is the definitive talk, frankly, on building a successful Ruby Brigade. Uh, it's entitled Nerd Party Version 3.1. And if you go to bit.ly slash nerdparty31, uh, it'll take you to the conference talk on that. Uh, frankly, I think uh, if you have any work to do to get done during the conference, just go ahead and do that right now. And uh, then later, go back and watch this talk. Uh, Ryan's insights are uh, excellent and uh, very insightful. And that's where I direct people uh, when they want to learn how to run a Ruby Brigade or any technical cub. Uh, club for that matter. So a uh, quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you attend any sort of Ruby Brigade? OK. And uh, out of those folks, how many of you help out in any small way? Whether run the, can you stand up, please? Can you stand up, those of you who in any small way run or help out? Can we give these guys a, a, a round of applause? <laughs> if you see these people during the conference, I'm serious. Go and thank them. Because uh, doing this sort of thing can be a bit difficult, and it can be a bit thankless. But really, it's uh, the Ruby Brigades that have a lot to do with our culture. Um, uh, how many of you live in rural areas? Rural areas. Like, how many of you live like with a couple hours that you really don't go out to Ruby Brigades? So yeah, there's a few. Um, how many of you don't like your local Ruby Brigade and don't go out to it? Ah! <laughs> Eric, back there. Um, anyway, uh, the, um, I want to start with a story uh, before I jump into my talk. So in World War II, the Allies relied heavily on bombing the enemy to try and turn the tide of the war. However, they were losing a lot of planes from ground fire and from air combat. When many of the planes returned, they were often shot up so badly that it was a wonder they could fly at all. We need to reinforce these planes with armor said the leaders in charge. But the engineers had a problem. If we put too much armor on them, then the planes will either be too heavy to fly or they'll burn too much fuel to be able to make the trip. So there was this mathematician named Abraham Wald who was asked to catalog where all the bullet holes had torn through the planes. He produced a diagram that reflects something similar to this. The plane on the left uh, represented the undamaged plane, and the plane on the right showed where the planes were taking most of the damage. So the superior said, ah, we need to reinforce the wings and the nose and the tail, because that's where the damage is occurring. 
As everyone nodded in agreement at the obviously sage display of wisdom from their superiors, a lone voice spoke up. Uh, sir, said Wald, I'd reinforce the areas where there are no bullets. What? They said incredulously. But that's where all the damage is. But sir, said Wald, these are the planes that came back. So, as the obviousness of Wald's observation sunk in, the engineers began the task of reinforcing the planes. So there is a lesson to be learned here. Sometimes it's not about reinforcing the problem areas. Sometimes it's about reinforcing the things that we need to protect the most. So I want to come back to that point later, but first let's talk about Ruby and Ruby on Rails. We are extremely blessed to have a rich and vibrant choice of conferences that you can attend. You've got big multi-track events like RailsConf and RubyConf to smaller regional conferences like, like this one. And they all work to support the community, and that is awesome. But the real strength of our community lies at the local level, or what we like to call Ruby Brigades. Other names include uh, Ruby User Groups, or Rugs, or Nerd Club, or Geek Outs, or whatever. It doesn't matter really what you call it. This is where people get together in person to help each other. You want to learn to code? Need help hacking on a project? Do you dream of earning a living, running your own business, living the life of a digital Bedouin where you can work where you want, or when you want, and for who you want? So I just want, I just want to stop my talk here for a second um, and let you in on an awesome uh, Ruby Brigade club hack. Be nice to sponsors. Uh, mention them in your talks and do things like retweet their tweets during conferences. In fact, if everyone could go to Bitly uh, Cascadia sponsors and download, there's a little a text file, a little gist file. It's a list of the conference sponsors here at Cascadia. I personally am keeping a running tally of how many times I've retweeted a sponsor's tweet. So by the end of the conference, I will have retweeted every company at least once. Now, why, why do this? See, companies are cool. They have these things called marketing budgets, and which means folks like you and me can get stuff for free. So the gist is just a text file, and um, anyway, so, that's, so let's go back to the talk here. Uh, Ruby Brigades exist to help you, and more importantly, for you to help others. But there's a big problem with Ruby Brigades right now. If you happen to live near a large metropolitan area like San Francisco, or Portland, or Seattle, then there's probably a Ruby Brigade near you that really, really rocks. Uh, but me, I don't live near a big city. The nearest city for me is in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is 90 minutes away. I live in Chilliwack, British Columbia, which is a little town way out in the sticks, and yes, it's as podunk as it sounds. Uh, but hey, Chilliwack, we have all kinds of resources for aspiring web developers like cows and, <laughs> and corn. So undeterred, I decided to be positive and take the advice of Seth Godin that the way to get unstuck is to start down the wrong path right now. So when I was going to start my very own Ruby Brigade, I went in and boy, did I ever go down some wrong paths. I, I tried to build a group three times but no matter how much work and planning I did, it just kept failing and failing and failing. And that made me sad because, you know, you put all this effort in and nobody shows up. And so there was no hope of me being in a Ruby Brigade anywhere near me. So in desperation, I decided that after work, I would leave immediately at 4 p.m. and drive well over 200 kilometers from Chilliwack, British Columbia cross the border into the United States and into Washington State, drive all the way to Seattle to the Seattle Ruby Brigade, and who meets every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. in Capitol Hill District in the best coffee shop, Vivace. Uh, I'd stay there for a couple hours. I'd pretend that I was a local. I would barely talk to anyone. And then it was all over. I would drive all the way back. <laughs> now, I know this seems crazy, and I suppose it is, but at the time, the Ruby community in Vancouver was languishing. Yes, the internet was there, and that's, you know, that works if you know what questions to ask. But can anybody relate to the fact that sometimes you don't know the questions to ask? Can anybody relate to that? Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. I, there's a lot of you, I know because I've talked to many of you. In fact, I've talked to hundreds of people over the last six or seven years that this is the case. So 
not only do you need to know what the right questions are to ask, you really need to know how to ask them the right way on the internet. And heaven help the poor soul that doesn't do that right. But I was struggling so much I didn't even know what to do. So the cool thing is, those crazy trips turned everything around for me and made all the difference. Uh, Seattle Ruby Brigade was the first Ruby group in the world. For over a decade, these folks have created and maintained over 350 projects from just 19 people. Every single one of us in this room rely on the work that they do. We literally own our livelihoods to these men and women. Uh, who here is from the Seattle Ruby Brigade? Stand up, guys. Come on. Let everybody see you. Yes, Aaron, even you. So, that, <laughs> I love how only two people stood. <laughs> so the first few months that I attended Seattle RB, I hardly talked to anyone, but then I finally mustered up the courage and I talked to Ryan Davis. Yes, that's right, Zen Spider, a man who loves to hurt code because, you know, people are terrified of this guy. But it turns out that, that Ryan actually is a heck of a nice guy. He offered on more than one occasion for me to let me let crash uh, at his place. And if I was too tired to drive home, uh, he said, yeah, I just crashed my place. Uh, I told Ryan about my three failed attempts to start a group, so he shared with me the secret of Seattle RB. And it worked. Um, I started what was called the Fraser Valley Ruby Brigade on uh, January 10th, 2009. And uh, we specified, instead of the city, we specified the region uh, which is uh, east of Vancouver, because the towns out in the valley are just too small to maintain a group. So, we are in our sixth year as a Ruby Club. <laughs> We're not that big, but for a rural club, we have over 80 members. We average uh, uh, three to five people out every single week hacking on projects. So now that we know it's possible to clone the Seattle Ruby Brigade, even in rural areas, I want to share with you what Ryan taught me. So now remember what I was saying earlier, that the things that need protecting most? Uh, oddly enough, the things that we think need reinforcing, like presentations or food or membership, those things actually really don't matter as much. What really, really matters to reinforce a club three things. Number one, hack nights. Most clubs do focus on presentations, but those are a lot of work to prepare. If you're trying to build a Ruby Brigade, you seem to be endlessly chasing people to do a talk. With hack nights, only one person has to show up. There's no work, there's no pizzas, there's no incentives. You just hack on code. Also, presentations can actually work against you. When you watch a presentation, generally people have sort of an you know, arms crossed consumption mentality, which leads to point number two, bring a project. If members are encouraged to bring a project they work on, the arms are now unfolded, and now we're talking about hands on the keyboard. People show up wanting to create something, rather than consume what others have worked hard to prepare. This attention shift from being a consumer to a creator has an interesting side effect of repelling recruiters and people who are there to look for someone to build their next awesome idea. So when people show up and they want to build the next Facebook or Google, you know, we'll help you with your project, but we're not going to do it for you. Number three, meet every week. If you want to be successful at a project and you aren't working at it at least once a week, your enthusiasm and your momentum on that project fades. So if you want to start a Ruby Brigade, especially in a rural area, or you want to start a different Ruby Brigade that maybe isn't meeting your particular needs, just set aside two hours a week, uh, once a week, and that's it. No, really, that's it. You can meet just about anywhere, a local coffee shop, someone's house, a high school, anywhere with free Wi-Fi. If you end up being the only one there after a week, so what? You're there to hack on a project. So you're still there, you're still working, pushing your idea forward. And you never have to chase people down to you know, put on a, 
uh, a presentation or you don't have to chase people, you know, asking them to attend every week. The fact is people are busy. They have lives outside of Ruby and people will actually find comfort in the fact that they know of at least one person meeting in one location every week to geek out and hack on stuff. So when it's convenient for people to come, they just show up. And I'm amazed how many people come and they say, oh, I'm so sorry, I haven't been here for weeks. And we literally say, dude, it's totally fine, we're here every week. So now we have folks, some will come like uh, once every three months or sometimes they'll come for a spurt, they'll come for like you know three months straight and then they just stop coming and it's totally fine. There's no guilt, there's no shame about it. And the likelihood, if you are showing up in one location, hacking on a project, the likelihood that you'll grow from one person into a full-fledged club is actually very high. So also, there's tons of perks running your own club. Remember earlier I talked about the free stuff from sponsors? Well, for starters, you don't have to buy books anymore. All the major technical book publishers have user group programs. So here's the library for the Fraser Valley Ruby Brigade. We have over 90 books. They're all paper, they're not e-books. This is actually, you know, the, the paper books. Uh, members in our club, they come to me and they just simply ask, you know, can I get a copy of such and such book? And I order it for them. And it's free. I live in Canada. Shipping anything in Canada is ridiculously expensive. But I get all these free. The companies cover all that. There's no shipping costs at all. So how do you do this? How do you get free books? You just do a Google search for the book publisher's name and user group program. And that's it. Generally, all they ask you for is, you know, can somebody, either you or somebody in the club, can you write a review on Amazon? That's all they want. So you can start building a library. Hey, if it's just you, a one-man club, and you can show on meetup.com or however you promote your group that you actually have people coming out, these companies are more than happy to give you free books. Um, the biggest two publishers, by the way, that we use are O'Reilly and Pearson. So just O'Reilly user book program, Pearson user book program, or user group program, and that's all you need to do. Other free stuff that you can get includes things like swag and t-shirts and conference tickets, conference tickets and promotional cost. For example, um, our club happens to use uh, meetup.com, which seems to work well for us. We've tried different things, but meetup.com works well. Um, I asked a, comp a local company, uh, where actually it wasn't a, it's not even a local company, we're in Chilliwack, they're down in San Francisco. I asked them if they would be willing to pick up our meetup.com dues, which are like 72 bucks twice a year. And all I do is have a little promotion of them. I talk about them in the club uh, if they have something that's new. And they've been supporting us like 144 bucks for like half a decade now. Um, so if there are any expenses that you incur for running a user group, don't just reach for your wallet or your purse, just ask a company that they'll cover the cost for you in exchange for some sort of promotion or, or whatever it is that they ask, just ask them. So that's how you can clone the Seattle Ruby Brigade or the Fraser Valley Ruby Brigade, or actually there's several other Ruby Brigades that are, that are doing this model. If you need any help with anything that I've talked to you about today, just hit me up on Twitter uh, if you're a company looking for someone to promote Ruby user groups and would be willing to pay me to do it full time from remote locations like some companies are doing, um, just uh, hit me up as well. Uh, the, the beautiful part about uh, the kind of job that I do is that not only are you are building goodwill in the community, but uh, you get to meet everybody. You build relationships with people in the Ruby world. So when that company is looking to hire, you can find potential hires without being, you know, this scummy recruiter. It's just a natural conversation. So get out there, find a project that you're passionate about, that you want to build, commit yourself to work on it for at least two hours a week in one location, and invite others to come and join you. So let's all continue to work to make the Ruby programming language community the best tech community on the planet. And because I like to recycle my jokes, here's my dog Bailey. And one time he got a purse stuck around his neck. <laughs> so, is there any questions? Has anybody tried to start a group and it's either language? I know some of you are. I was talking to you at lunch. Come on, put a hand up. Yes, give me a question. <laughs> no, no. <laughs>
No questions at all. Yes. It's actually not. Uh, it. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, the question was uh, when you are, re are um, let me see if I said this right, if you are uh, uh, there every week, how hard is it to keep the momentum going? If you're the only one? If you're the only one? Well, I would assume that most people who are get into programming or something like that, a lot of people have like this idea burning in their gut, something that they want to build, something that's interesting. So if you're going to build that anyway, just make that commitment. Two hours a week, I'm going to get out of the house, I'm going to go to coffee shop or whatever, and you sit down and you work on your project. Um, if you're going to do that anyway, as DHH a lot of times says, you know, stop watching TV and take that time that you would normally watch TV and work on a project. You can build stuff. He built Basecamp 10 hours a week. So does that answer your question? No, it doesn't. No, let's dialogue here. What, what, what's, what's sort of bugging you there? Oh, well, don't, don't do a communal space. Go to a coffee shop. No, no, you, that's the point. You don't have to prepare anything. Uh, I used to have like a little paper thing. I had a little logo, Fraser Valley Rue Brigade. I would sit there. I put it just on the coffee shop. Uh, people, uh, we used meetup.com. So some people would RSVP, others didn't. And because I'm going there anyway to work on a project, when somebody shows up, hey, how you doing? Oh, good. What are you working on? Oh, I'm working on this. What are you working on? Oh, really cool. Week after week, um, it's very common where we don't even do any coding. Uh, we will talk about tech-related things, but because the focus is on projects, as opposed to going out for a beer or, or some other social thing, it always ends up coming back to working on a project. And because you're working on a project, you don't have other people coming in, hey, can you build this for me? Hey, can you build this for me? You just simply say, well, hey, I'll help you build that. Why don't you get started? And people that aren't willing to do the work, they leave. Well, that's what we want, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't think you're totally happy. Next question, anybody else got a question or concern? No? Yes? By the way, how, how close are you to Myrtle Creek? No, I-5. If you go down I-5, you said Central Oregon. So halfway in there is a little place called Myrtle Creek. Uh, are you anywhere near there at all? No? Okay. Oh, you're on the other side of the mountains. Okay. Uh, if anybody happens to be near there, I'm going to visit a friend who uh, disappeared about a year ago. You would all know the name. I'm not going to say his name, but I'm going to visit him tomorrow and see how he's doing. And he lives near Myrtle Creek. So, uh, any other questions? Yes? Of course you do. Let's go back to the question that I awkwardly didn't answer properly. <laughs> go ahead, Brian. So to summarize, he was answering the very first question, and he said, don't worry about it. Uh, actually, now, Brian is amazing. Uh, Brian, you graduated from where? No, 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 no. You were valedictorian at where? <laughs> the guy was like an art major. He graduated valedictorian and decided, I don't want to do this. And he drove from, like I mentioned, not wanting to go to Vancouver. He lives in downtown Vancouver. So he would drive all the way to our club because the Vancouver scene was dead. And... Uh, and he would come and visit us. We got him interested in Ruby. I hooked him up with one of the members of our club, which is Dan Cub. Uh, he's the maintainer of Data Mapper. And uh, they got talking. And now you're working at where? Unbounce. Unbounce. Are you guys looking to hire anybody? Always go talk to the guys if you want to go work in downtown Vancouver at Unbounce. So uh, I got just a couple minutes here on the end. I wanted to kind of run an idea by you guys. Uh, you know, the whole idea of. Uh, 
RB or Ruby Brigade came from the fact that you've got, you know, dot RB. That's, that was, I, who made that up, Ryan, uh, was it Ryan or you, Eric, or, no? Probably Ryan, okay. So I have this sort of thing, when you talk about a Ruby Brigade, I mean, a brigade is a big bunch of people, so I'm, for years I've been kind of thinking, you know, micro brigade or, or something like that, which doesn't make sense. Um, so, I, you know, I've been checking around all these things like Ruby brats or boneheads or I don't know. I could never think about something. So we all know what a hashtag is. Um, what about if instead of having a hashtag, you have a tag hash? And you go and you sit down wherever, computer, and uh, you just tweet, when you normally tweet about something or use any Facebook, you just put that RB hash out there, which is kind of a signal saying, hey, I'm here and I'm hacking on stuff. Like if you're at this conference today, uh, you're working on something, RB hash, I'm over at whatever. And that kind of opens the door to anybody who wants to come and sit down with you. Uh, are you all familiar with the, the Dreyfus model? Has anybody not seen this? All right, great. So. Uh, most people have seen this. The, the, the Dreyfus model could even actually kind of map to this, where you could say, you know, I'm working on such and such project, RB hash 5, which means you, you see yourself as an expert or a master, as opposed to RB1 or something, you know? Um, just the idea, and the other reason I kind of like this is because then you can talk like a pirate. What? I didn't hear you, sorry. RB. <laughs> See, you can have lots of fun. Help me, RB1 Kenobi, yes. Uh, but the other thing is R, R be hashing on code, right? <laughs> so I don't know, what do you think? Is that like, for those of you who are, it's just kind of an idea, I don't know. The idea is to try and get individuals who need help. Because I remember coming to these conferences and not knowing anybody but wanting to get help and so, you, you know, you put the Cascadia hashtag, and I'm sitting in such and such working on stuff. If I threw something like RB hash or RB hash one, then it kind of gives an indication to people. So anyway, think about it. Uh, if you think it's a cruddy idea, uh, too bad, but that's the end of it. So. <laughs>